Everything is beautiful in its own way. Everybody is beautiful in their own way. Comedy and music legend Ray Stevens has spanned multi-generations with 60 years of fabulous music, including his Grammy Award-winning classics, Everything is Beautiful and Misty, as well as his comedic hits like the multi-million selling records, The Streak and Guitar Zan. And through it all, he gives the Lord glory. This is his story. This is today's Nashville. This is Faith. Ray Stevens, I cannot believe I am sitting at your piano at the cabaret. You know, my husband and I at Christmas time came to your show and we had so much fun. Everybody was having a great, great time. The gentleman next to us, I mean, he was laughing so hard. I was afraid, I mean, his face was so red. I thought, oh, I hope he doesn't pass out. Thank you so much for inviting me well, here. thank you for being here. And uh, uh, this uh, red piano has become kind of uh, symbolic of this showroom. So <clears throat> did you design this? Yeah, I had it built and uh, the guts are just a, a regular electric piano, uh, Kurzweil, I think. And uh, it just sits in this slot that was built when I built the piano and uh, it uh, has worked pretty well. Well, Ray, you have been in entertainment for over 60 years. Yeah. Ooh. I mean, take me back to where it all started. When did you know that music was going to be your life? I think I was about uh, 17 when I, 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 I knew that it was going to happen. I kind of felt like it would would a lot earlier than that but uh you know when i was six years old my mother gave me insisted that i take piano lessons <clears throat> and i didn't want to i wanted to go out and play baseball with the rest of the guys in the neighborhood but uh, uh she insisted that i practice one hour a day so i did and uh, i'm glad she insisted on that because uh, pretty soon i started uh kind of understanding how the keyboard worked and uh, so I continued my piano lessons, started when I was six, and I continued for 15 years with those piano lessons, it's classical music. It's worked out pretty good. Did you learn to love the piano? Oh yeah, sure. So where were you born? A little mill village, cotton mill village, Clarkdale, Georgia. Back in those days, uh, there was a, the Clark Thread Company and they had mills all over the southeast. Our mill, I think, was a spinning mill. They made thread. And uh, my dad worked at the mill. And so everybody in, in the little village had a house that was supplied by the mill. All the houses sort of looked the same. They were all white clapboard with slate roofs, and uh, they were nice little houses. Uh, a lot of kids in the neighborhood, and we used to play ball, and, you know, had a sw they had a swimming pool in that little Mill Village and uh, learned to swim when I was six years old. And it was a lot of fun. So from, you mentioned you were about 17 when you knew that music was going to be your career. Yeah. What happened then? Well, you know, I moved <clears throat> from Clarkdale when I was 10 years old down to Albany, Georgia. There was another mill down there <clears throat> and my dad was transferred. So we moved to Albany, Georgia I continued piano lessons down there, and uh, I met a guy named Bill Lowry, uh, who just started a music publishing company. Went to a little Baptist church down the street from my house in Atlanta, and um, my Sunday school teacher, 
I must have got up in church and played the piano and sang or something, I don't know. He came to me in Sunday school and said, you need to meet Bill Lowry. And I said, who's Bill Lowry? And he said, he started a music publishing company and he's looking for songs. You do write songs. And I said, well, I do now. So I met Bill Lowry. I went to see him the next day. And uh, he said, well, write me a song. <clears throat> and so I was pumped up. I went home and wrote a song that night. And I took it to him the next day and he liked it. And he was connected. He knew people in the music business, in the record business. He knew a producer in California who produced records for Capitol Records <clears throat> named Ken Nelson. And Ken came to Nashville quite often to record country singers in the Nashville studios. He sent my song to Ken Nelson and he liked it and he said, well, why don't we sign him to Capitol Records and I'll come to Nashville and we'll produce a record. And so I was all for that, of course. I'm 17 years old, I'm still in high school. So we came up to Nashville and I mean, Atlanta was a bigger city, but didn't have any studios to speak of like Nashville did. And so we came up and I made my first record in 1957. And uh, what was the song? It was called Silver Bracelet. It was about teenage jewelry. Back in those days, uh, they had what they called identification bracelets. And on one side, you put the girl's name, and on the other back side, you put your name. And your, the guys would give them to the, their girls, you know, friend, girlfriends. I wrote a song about that, and it wasn't a hit, but uh, it got me hooked. I knew right there that uh, I wanted to be in the music business. And so I continued to write for Mr. Lowry. And uh, uh, in 1960, I wrote a song that uh, was the first song, and I recorded it, and it was the first song that ever did anything at all for my career. It was taken off, it was gonna be a hit. It was called Sergeant Preston of the Yukon. And uh, it was a novelty song, comedy song, uh, uh, about Sergeant Preston of the Yukon and his dog King. The record was gonna be a hit, it was taken off, and. In my exuberance, I had neglected to get permission from the people that owned the character, Sergeant Preston, to use him in a song. And so their lawyers sent a letter, oh, yeah. cease and desist. And so we had to pull the record off the market, but uh, it gave me a clue. I knew what to do. And so in 61, I wrote and recorded a song called Jeremiah Peabody's Polyunsaturated, Quick Dissolving, Fast Acting, Pleasant Tasting, Green and Purple Pills. And uh, that was a small hit. I think it went to 35 on the national chart, though. And I was uh, pretty happy with that. But in 1962, I wrote a song and recorded it that became my first big hit record. It's now considered to be politically incorrect, but uh, I always sing it on the show anyway. And uh, I like to point out that uh, during Desert Storm, when the U.S. tanks were chasing Saddam across the desert, <clears throat> the radio intercom and all those tanks was playing this song, Ahab the Arab. I uh, recorded Ahab the Arab in Nashville 20 days after I moved to Nashville in mm. 19, January 2nd, 1962. So how old were you then? I was 22, January 2nd, 1962. I wasn't quite 22. My birthday is uh, January 24th, so... I had a few days to go, but I, can't, I had moved up here from Atlanta to play piano on sessions. I wanted to be a session musician. And uh, I met uh, uh, all of Nashville, great national session musicians that are pictured on the murals here in the showroom. I was very lucky to have moved up at that time because uh, they were all very welcoming and very nice. And <clears throat> I played on a lot of sessions. And of course, when Ahab was a hit after I'd just moved up here, it was a hit in the summer of 62. I had to leave the session scene and kind of go on the road and, you know, milk the personal appearances from the hit record, so. But anyway, it all worked out pretty good. Well, Ray, we're gonna talk about some of your hits. And I heard that Taylor Swift has been stalking you, and we're gonna talk <laughs> about that when we come back. Ray, you have a way of taking what's going on in our culture and creating songs. You've had some amazing hits. Let's talk about some of your favorite Grammys. 
Uh, well, uh, the first Grammy I won was uh, For Everything is Beautiful. <clears throat> what, I, what inspired you with that? I, uh, I was signed to, to host the Andy Williams Summer Show on NBC. I uh, wanted to write a song that could be used as the theme song for that television show. And so I, you know, I bound and determined to do it. And I had a lot of failed attempts, but I finally hit on a, the, the song, Everything is Beautiful. And sure enough, it was a good enough song to be the theme for that television show. I recorded it before the television show was aired, though, and it won a Grammy for the Can best. you play a little bit of it? Oh, yeah, I'll see you. <clears throat> Everything is beautiful. In its own way Like a starry summer night Or a snow-covered winter's day Is that enough? Yes, yeah, oh. beautiful, it's beautiful. What inspired uh, you with that song? I hit on it, I think I read a, a little book of Chinese proverbs and that was one of them. Struck a note, struck a chord I should say and uh, so uh, I just wrote the song from there. How is your faith, though, in the Lord, how does that inspire you with some of your songs? I got to say that uh, I have been blessed by help uh, with my whole life. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I got to give the Lord credit because when I was 12, I joined the uh, Baptist Church. I was baptized in uh, in Albany, Georgia, and uh, I think that's a that's a good thing to do. I think that's a, a move that is very important in in people's lives because uh, you're saying that I believe, mm -hmm. and uh, if you say that in public, being baptized, I think uh, it opens the door mm -hmm. to get yeah. to get. Divine help. Yeah. You have a way of making people laugh with your music and your songs. Both, both are very, uh, you know, some are inspirational, some are uh, fun. Let's talk about the streak. The streak, uh, the idea came from, I was on a, an airplane flying from L.A. To, back to Nashville in 1969, I think. And I read a little article in a Newsweek magazine that was on the plane about a college student in UCLA that took off his clothes and ran through a crowd and they called it streaky. And I thought, well, now there's an idea for a song. And I got back home and I uh, wrote the song, went in the studio immediately and, and cut the record. I was still writing a song in the studio while we were uh, recording the song, but uh, I finished it up and we recorded that idea must have hit a lot of people because by the time I could get my record out, there were already 12 or so streaking records already on the market by other artists. Luckily, mine was the one that made it. It just came from a little story in a magazine. What about your other songs? Uh, get Tarzan, what inspired you there? A friend of mine, Bill Justice, he was a musician here in Nashville and, a, and an arranger, great musician. He was so good, he scored movies. Uh, and <clears throat> he was in Hollywood in 69, scoring a movie. I happened to be out there. Uh, he heard I was in town, called me uh, and came over to my hotel and uh, had, we had lunch and he said, I wanted to see you because I have a song title and uh, you're the only guy I know that can write it. And I said, okay, I'm very flattered. What is it, Bill? And he said, guitar sand, man. And I thought, well, yeah, that is funny. So I wrote the song on the plane flying home, I think, and uh, went in the studio and made the record. Uh, I got the record, uh, I was recording on Monument Records at that time, Fred Foster's label, and uh, Fred didn't like it. But I was friends with the head of promotion at Monument, and he said, Fred, I think you're wrong, let's put it out. I think it'll be a big hit. Fred said, well, all right, and so we put it out, and sure enough, Fred was wrong, it was, a, it was a pretty big hit. Well, you know, Ray, I look around your theater and I love how you just show everybody almost that you have worked with. Did you design? Yeah, I, uh, I'm a frustrated architect, you know, so I, uh, <clears throat> I built a theater in Branson, Missouri 
in the early 90s and I worked over there in my theater for three years and then sold it. I knew that uh, owning a theater was a good thing because we filled up every, we had 2,000 seats in that theater in Branson. We filled them, uh, had two shows a week, six days a week, and we filled that theater 12 shows a week. And uh, so I, I figured, you know, maybe Nashville could use a, a smaller theater to get the overflow from the Opry, so to speak. So uh, we built this, uh, gosh, I, I can't remember exactly so when. So you were living in uh, Branton and back and forth? Well, no, or? I never moved from Nashville. I, I had a place to stay over there. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, when I left Branson Soul Theater, I moved back to my house here in Nashville. I must have built it in, in 2016 or 17, something like that. The people I see on your walls, you've worked with so many. Any stories about any? Oh gosh, well, yeah, there's a story behind every picture. Well, I saw Michael Douglas on the wall. Oh yeah, I used to do his show up in Pennsylvania. He was in Pittsburgh, I think. He was a great guy, N nice guy. And Robert Redford, Robert Redford's on the wall? Yeah, he uh, came to Nashville to visit a friend of mine, Billy Sherrill, who was on the wall. He's a producer. He produced Tammy and George and a lot of people. Robert was in town trying to get uh, some uh, help with a charity that he was involved in. And I met him at uh, Billy's house. And then, of course, uh, I turned down the song Raindrops Falling on My Head that he was a big star in uh, because I had just rec recorded one of Chris Stollerson's first songs, Sunday Morning Coming Down, and I had spent so much time in the studio making that Chris Stollerson song into a record that uh, I thought, well, if I take this song, Raindrops Falling on My Head, that's been offered, I'll pass, I'll mess up the Sunday morning, come. somebody else will beat me out with Sunday morning coming down. So I passed on Raindrops, brilliant move, and uh, my regular Sunday morning came out and didn't sell many. And so I had struck out on both songs, but uh, I, uh, recovered when Andy called me Williams and said, you want to host the Andy Williams Summer Show on NBC? And I said, yes, thank you. Well, Ray, you did a video. It's if, if Jesus was a stranger, you're not in the right circle of friends. And we're going to talk about that when we get back. Ray, I saw your video, funny of Taylor Swift is stalking me. It was hilarious. How did that all come about? <clears throat> well, it was such a ludicrous statement and a, a ludicrous title for a song. I thought, well, you know, people might like this. And so I got, uh, I, it was an idea sent to me by Chuck Redden, uh, who lived down in Alabama and uh, a friend of mine. And uh, Buddy, I got Buddy Cal, another friend to help me fill in the blanks because uh, the song wasn't finished. But the idea came from Chuck. So we wrote this song and, uh, you know, made the record and then made a video to go with it. And uh, it was Did pretty... Taylor ever know about it? Oh, I'm sure she did. I never heard from her, but uh, <laughs> was... I'm sure she did. Tell me a little bit about Jesus. Would Jesus wear a Rolex? Well, Chad Atkins, a good buddy of mine, uh, got with a girl named Margaret Archer. And Margaret uh, was, you know, uh, in the music business through television. She uh, was involved in TV production out at Opryland, and and they wrote this song. I think Margaret uh, came up with the idea from watching televangelists on TV, "Would Jesus Wear a Rolex?" And so she and Chet wrote the song and called me, and I said, "Of course, I'll record that." And so I did. Did you have fun with it? Sure. Yeah, it was a lot of fun to record that. And I also saw the video and your song of, uh, we talked about it, If Jesus Was a Stranger. Some, yeah, uh, that wasn't a video, that was a performance, a I performance. think, on the Larry Black TV right. show. Uh, Jesus is a stranger, check your circle of friends. Mm -hmm. Don Cusick is the guy that wrote that, another buddy of mine, and uh, you know, it, yeah. I'm always being given great little songs uh, to record, and uh, I, don't, I don't know if I ever recorded this one, 
I don't think I have yet, but I probably will uh, when I get a chance. Well, what would you say to somebody that didn't know Jesus? I'm not a preacher, but I'd say you're missing out. And you had a huge hit with the gospel song, Love Lifted Me. Yeah, I remember being in uh, church and Sunday school, and we would sing that. And in church, everybody sang it. Love lifted me, love lifted me, like that. But when I recorded it, I recorded it like, love lifted me, oh, love lifted me, like that. Did you get a Grammy for that? I don't think so. No, I know I didn't get a Grammy for that. So tell me what it's like on Saturday evenings here. Well, it's a lot of fun. Everybody, come, people come and uh, we, uh, the piano bar is open. I think he opens at 5 or 5.30. <clears throat> and people come and they go to the piano bar and then they, if they want to eat, they, uh, they come in, sit down and uh, they're served dinner. And then at 7.30, I come out and we do a show for a couple of hours. What's your favorite part of the evening? Well, I don't know. You know, it's, it's all, uh, well, you know, I don't really get involved until, until showtime. And uh, then after the show, I go out usually to the piano bar and, and uh, meet and greet the few people that have stayed over to enjoy John Genethis in the piano bar. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, that's a lot of fun. So did you raise your family here? Yeah. Yeah, I have, I have two girls. Two daughters. And, and you were married 60 years. Yeah, that's right. And we, when we moved up, uh, we moved the baby with us because she was born in Atlanta. Of course, the second girl was born here. Ray, when you look back on your career, 60 years, and the people that you've met, and everything that you've done, were there any challenges? Were there any difficult times? Of course, yeah. Every, uh, every life has difficult times. <clears throat> but you deal with it and move on, you know. What would you say to somebody that is getting into the music uh, industry or today in Nashville? What music has changed so much since the internet. Mm -hmm. It's changed uh, quite a bit, and in my humble opinion, not for the better. Not for the better. So, uh, but you can still, you know, have a good career in the music business. You just got to know that that's what you want to do and be bound and determined and uh, of course be somewhat talented and uh, stick it out, you know, jump in and don't give up. Ray, are you still writing songs? Oh yeah, I uh, started my publishing companies, I started the first one in 63 and then I added, uh, that, that was a BMI company and then I added an ASCAP company and a CSAC company and another BMI company, so I've got I think four publishing companies, and uh, I've always liked to write songs, and so I'm still writing, and, uh, and a lot of people, uh, friends of mine over the years, sing, send me songs from time to time, and uh, uh, it's, you know, I've got just a plethora of songs that I'm waiting to record. I have to, uh, I built a studio in the back of the uh, cabaret here. I have to find the time to get in there and record some of these new songs that I have written and received from buddies of mine. And uh, I enjoy that. I, I look forward to doing that. What inspires you to write your songs? Just life or? I don't know. It's just, uh, <clears throat> I love music and, uh, you know, that's just part of it. Uh, from my perspective, that's how I got into the music business by writing a song. There's a slogan that I think it goes, it all begins with a song. And I think that's from the National Songwriters Association, of which I am a member. You can't help, once you get started as a songwriter, you can't help but uh, get ideas from time to time. Just from what somebody says or seeing something in a billboard or a magazine. And so, you know, I still try to write. So what's next for you? Uh, yeah, performing on stage and making records and uh, seeing what I can do. Well, Ray, I just want to thank you so much for inviting me to the cabaret. And I just pray that many, many blessings to you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. My friend, is Jesus a stranger to you? 
Take him in your circle of friends today. You won't be disappointed. Your life will never be the same. This is Today's Nashville. This is Faith. Stone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.